Good evening, this is Pastor Dominic from Evanda Revival Center. Welcome to the Saturday Night Live service here on Facebook. Tonight I'm going to be preaching about the one decision to make in a time of crisis. The one decision you've got to make in a time of crisis, every single person has to make that, that decision. Especially if you're a child of God, it's a decision you're going to have to make. It's a decision that's going to confront you. And it's a decision that's going to determine whether you move forward or you go backwards in life. And I've seen so many children of God have to make this decision. And it is a decision, and I'm going to reveal it to you in a moment, that we all are confronted with at one point in our lives. And tonight I'm in the book of Ruth. Now Ruth is right after the book of Judges. I'm going to be reading in chapter 1 tonight. I'm going to share an awesome story, revelation that the Holy Spirit has shared with me. And I want to share it with you. And I believe it's going to speak to you. And I believe it's going to bless you. So I want you to get your heart ready to hear from God. And welcome to everybody that's online. Welcome to all of you that are coming online right now. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this word. I believe it's going to bless you tonight. Good evening, Henry Bridger. Good evening, Andre Loschbach. It's good to have you all online. Welcome, Eovold Boma. Welcome, Trudy De Beer. Welcome, Theo and Mariki Kreer. Welcome, Yulani and Michael Boerter. Welcome, Ann Wilson. Welcome, Mandy Mayer. Welcome, Quitty Reinika. Welcome, Luwini Loschbach. Welcome, Lizelle Bates. Amen. Good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. And thank you to all of you at a later stage that's watching. God bless you. Well, let's get into the book of Ruth, into the Bible. We're going to be spending time in the Word of God. Ruth, chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading a couple of verses tonight. I'm going to read from verse 6 right down to verse 16. Listen to what the Bible says. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters in, daughter-in-laws, she set out from the place where she had been living. And they took the road that would lead back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes instead of coming with me. And may the Lord reward you, reward you for the kindness... To your husbands, reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. Verse 9. May the Lord bless you with security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye and they all broke down and wept. Verse 10. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who would grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has caused me to suffer. And again they wept together. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth insisted on staying with Naomi. See, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to the people and to her gods. You should do the same. Verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. I will go wherever you go and I will live wherever you live. And your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Now, in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, we read right here in verse 1, and I want to read the scripture to you. Listen to what the Bible says. In the days when the judges ruled Israel, a man from Bethlehem in Judah left the country because of a severe famine. He took his wife and two sons and went to live in the country of Moab. Now, the book of Ruth starts out by telling us that it was written in the time when Judges ruled over the nation of Israel. Now, Judges was the book preceding the book of Ruth. It was the period before Kings. Judges were uh, 
They came up and they ruled over the 12 tribes of Israel, which was somewhat of a commonwealth in the history of Israel. This is after Joshua had died and the nation of Israel were busy becoming more and more established in the promised land, in the land of Canaan. But the time of Judges was also a very dark spiritual time in the history of Israel. Now, if you go read the very last verse of the book of Judges, this is the verse right before the book of Ruth. Listen to what the Bible says. In those days, Israel had no king. So the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Judges chapter 21 verse 25. This speaks about how Israel lived according to their own conviction and they had no regard for God. They did not consider his ways and they did not obey his law. And as a result of living in disobedience, habitual disobedience, they have now come under judgment and a famine has come across the land. Now, a famine is a progression of bad events. It first starts out in a drought. As a result of the drought, there can be no harvest. And a result of no harvest eventually leads to famine. Famine is where there's widespread hunger and poverty. So the nation of Israel in the book of Ruth, as we start to read this book, is in a time of crisis. The economy has collapsed. The people are suffering. The people are struggling. And it's all because they did not obey God. They chose not to obey God. In fact, God said in his law, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16 to 17, he told Israel, if you do not obey my commands, I will shut the heavens and I will not give you harvests. Now, the Bible says as a result of the famine, as a result of these difficult circumstances, there was a man who stayed in Bethlehem and Bethlehem in the biblical times Bethlehem and the surrounding areas was an agriculture area, region. This is where there was a lot of farmers. This is where there was a lot of shepherds, flocks. And this is where people would harvest. But the Bible says that there was a man that stayed there. And as a result of the famine, meaning that there was no harvest, he made a conscious decision to move to Moab, to leave Bethlehem, the nation of Israel, to cross over the Jordan River and to go back into the wilderness where God had delivered Israel from and to go to Moab. Now, Moab was a pagan and godless nation. It symbolizes the world. It had no regard for God. It had no regard for God's ways. In fact, Moab was a demon worshiping tribe or nation. And this man takes his wife and his two sons and he leaves Israel, Bethlehem, which is actually a place of destiny. It is a place that would one day be the birthplace of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In fact, the dynasty of David would begin in Bethlehem. This is where uh, David would be coronated as a king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. So he leaves a place of destiny. He leaves a place of promise to go to Moab, a wicked and evil place. This man's name, it's quite interesting. His name is Elimelech. Now, Elimelech means my God is king. So in other words, there was destiny and purpose on Elimelech's life. But he made a decision without praying. He made a decision without consulting God. He made a decision based upon his circumstances and his emotions and what he felt was best. Much like what Judges chapter 21 verse 25 tells us. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And he made a decision in line with that theme. And he moves his whole family out of Israel. Now, why would you want to go back to a place where God has delivered you from? Why would you go, want to go back to a place where God has brought you out of? Why would you want to go back into the wilderness? But I've seen this take place so many times in the church. I've seen people serve God. 
They come to the house of promise because that's what the church is supposed to be. A place of destiny. But then they make a decision to go back to Moab. They go back to the world. And when they do that, they are basically going back to the very place that God had delivered them out. Precious children of God. I've seen this. Children of God that have even been filled with the Holy Spirit and encountered God. I've seen how they've gone back into the world. Much like the prodigal son. The prodigal son was staying under his father's roof. But he made a conscious decision to take his inheritance and to leave his father's house and go to the world. But I want to tell you, Moab, the world, will strip you naked, will steal your inheritance, and will leave you poor and broken. Well, we see in this story, Elimelech goes off to Moab with his wife and his ten children. And what begins to take place is ten years of suffering for his wife Naomi and the whole family. The Bible tells us that Elimelech actually died in Moab. Now, if you go read the original translation, it, see, it says that he sojourned to Moab with the idea that he would eventually go back to Bethlehem. But I want to tell you, one step out of the will of God is one step into the trap of Satan. One step out of the purpose and the calling of God. Is one step too far. And the devil wants us to believe that we have to move in a certain direction. That we don't have to always pray. That we don't always have to consult godly counsel. That we don't always have to wait for confirmation from God before we make a decision. And that's a trick and a lie of the enemy. He wants to rob you of your inheritance. He wants to rob you of your purpose. And Elimelech had purpose. He came from a place of purpose. But he took his whole family and he went to Moab and he died in Moab. In fact, later, his sons would marry Moabite women, which was not accepted in Israel in that time. In fact, it was encouraged that Israelites should not marry Canaanites and they should not marry people outside of Israel. The reason being is because not because uh, the law was racist, but rather that the cultures of outside nations and tribes were not to infiltrate the living or the culture of Israel. So by marrying, having intermarriage, it would pollute the culture and the ways of the Israelites. And God wanted to, them to be a nation that is set apart, pure and holy unto him. So it was encouraged not to marry Moabites or Canaanites. But you see, when Elimelech, made that decision to move his family out of Bethlehem, out of Judah, out of the place of destiny and promise. It would later influence the decisions of his children. And I'm saying this because sometimes you make decisions and you think that you only will face the consequences. I want to tell you, it can influence your children. It can influence their decision-making process. It can influence their futures. It can influence the direction in which their lives go. And we see this take place in this story. Elimelech, who was married to Naomi, he dies. He leaves her a widow. And later, her two sons die in Moab. Their lives are cut too short, too soon. They die young. When they should have lived, when they should have started families, when they should have had purpose, they died young. You see, Moab is cruel. The world is cruel. I want to tell you, the world is cruel. It will rob you of your joy. It will steal your blessing. Well, Bible scholars actually suggest through studying ancient scriptures and books that these two boys were actually involved in idol worship and as a result a curse came upon them. Well, we have got no um, proof of that according to the scripture. It would actually make sense because why weren't they prospering in Moab? Well, their dad took them out of Israel and he took them to Moab. So he took them into a cursed place. But Naomi, who was the mother, who was married to Elimelech, First, she becomes widowed and she has to bury her own husband. And to be a widow in biblical times was 
was not the most pleasant thing. In fact, it was the worst thing that could happen to you. Because if you became a widow, that means that you did not have a breadwinner. And you, being a female, could not go out and work for yourself. So, Yaris Naomi, trying to start over her life in Moab. She loses her husband, has to bury her husband. Now she's a mourning widow. And then she loses her two sons. She loses her two sons and any chance of livelihood. And she's condemned to poverty, heartache and trauma. It's one thing to bury a spouse. It's another thing to bury a child. Now, I as a pastor have done many funerals. I've done funerals where people have buried their grandparents. I've done funerals where people have buried their parents. I've done funerals where people have buried a brother or sister or colleague. But there's no funeral like a mother that has to bury her own child. The tears at that funeral, it does not compare. And this woman did not even have to bury one child, but two children. She buries two children. Imagine the devastation. Imagine the heartache. Far away from home, in a foreign country, in a wicked and evil country. And yeah, she's having to bury her sons. In fact, Naomi, the name Naomi means pleasant. That's what her name means. But later on, her name changes to Mara. Mara means bitter. After spending 10 years in Moab, her name goes from Naomi, which is pleasant, to bitter. In fact, later on she would say in this very passage of scripture in Ruth chapter 1, she would say, I went out full and I've come back empty. I've come back empty. Ten years her life was destroyed. In ten years her life was devastated. I don't know if you've ever seen people. I've seen this happen so many times. I've seen people that have gone through difficult times and before they went through the difficult time they were actually quite pleasant people they were people that always had a smile on their face and then they will go through a difficult time a traumatic time they will go through tragedy they will experience hardship and it's as if they have aged many years it's as if they've just grown old overnight and not only that they're just different they're just different they are wearing the sorrow and burden that they've experienced. And this is the story of Naomi in Ruth chapter 1. She has experienced pain. In fact, she even says that it's God that has turned against her. You know how many people blame God just because they're going through a difficult time? Just because they've experienced a, bit, a difficult time? But I want to tell you, sometimes it's not God and sometimes it's not even the devil. Sometimes it's your decisions that you make. You see, her husband made a decision, a conscious decision. And later on, it cost her dearly and it cost her children dearly. And now she's left with two daughter-in-laws who are both also widows, far too young. How are they going to ever provide for themselves? How are they going to ever live? How are they ever going to survive? In biblical times, as widows, this was devastating. And these three of them. No future to speak of. Their dreams are crushed. But the Bible says in verse 6 something quite fascinating. And listen to this. Then Naomi heard. She heard. That the Lord had blessed his people in Judah. And how did the Lord bless his people? By giving them good crops. By giving them good crops. I want to read this. In the King James Version, because this is so powerful in the King James Version. Um, how it puts it, the, the translation. Listen to what, the, let's say, the New King James Version. Ruth chapter 1 verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters in laws, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people. There was a visitation from heaven in Judah, from God. He had visited his people. And the evidence of this was that he gave them bread. The Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Now she came from Bethlehem. She left Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the very definition of Bethlehem in the original language means the house of bread. 
So why did her and her husband leave Bethlehem? The Bible says because of the famine. In other words, there was no food in Bethlehem. And as a result of this devastation that was taking place, as a result of the famine, they left Bethlehem. The house of bread had no bread. So they turned to Moab, the world, crossing over the Jordan, going to a wicked, idolatrous place. But then she heard that there was bread again in Judah. Bethlehem, the house of bread, had bread again. I want to tell you, when people hear that God is visiting the church and he has blessed these people with bread, we're going to see people flock from Moab, the world, so to speak, back into the church. But it starts with inviting God into our midst and having a visitation from heaven. How sad is it when the church, the local church, has got no bread? How sad is it when people come to our church and they don't find the very presence and power of God? How sad is it when people come to the church and they, leave, they come hungry and they leave hungry because there's no revelation? We need the church. We need to be a Bethlehem, so to speak. We need to be the house of bread. We need to give fresh bread to God's people so that they can eat. So that they don't turn to Moab. One of the things that break my heart is to see how young people are searching for God. Then they don't find God when they go to church and they start turning to the world. Because what they find in the church is politics. What they find in the church is division, strife. They don't find bread. They find man and, their, and the ways of man. They don't find God. There's a, the church is advertising God. The church is advertising bread, so to speak. But there is none. And hungry people come to church to discover that there is no God. So what do they do then? They turn to the world. I'm going to tell you, there is a severe judgment that's going to come upon us as preachers, as the church, if we do not begin to present the word, the bread, the way God intended for us to do. When people come to the church, they need to be fed. They can't come in. This, they can't leave the same way they came in. What is the bread? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ himself. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 6 verse 35, I am the bread of life. You know, when Jesus said that, he was saying that I am the main meal. I am the main course. You see, today in our Western culture, bread is a side dish. If you have a meal, you have bread as a side dish. It's a complementary dish to the main course. It's a complementary side dish to the main course. But when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, he was speaking to a society and culture that had bread as its main meal at every meal. Breakfast, lunch and supper. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's saying, I am the main course. I am the main course. I am the main meal. I'm no complimentary side dish. I'm not something that complements the main meal. I am the main meal. And Bethlehem, the house of bread, would later be the place where the bread of life was born. John chapter 1 verse 14 says that Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So when we spend time in this word and we get revelation from this word, we are eating, feasting on the bread of heaven. But have we got God in our midst? If we've got God in our midst, that means that there is revelation. There's revelation in desperate times. I want to tell you, in times such as this, God wants to bless his people with harvests. You know, I was in prayer and I was praying and I just felt God saying to me, it's in this time, in this dark time that I want to give my goodness to my children. I want to bless my children with goodness. It's in a pandemic where God wants to bring forth healing. It is in a depression, economic collapse where God wants to release prosperity. Why? Because Romans chapter 2 verse 4 tells us it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. 
God wants to bless us with his goodness so that the people in the world can look at us and say, we want what you've got. There's just something different about you. There's just something different about the church. How is the world going to ever flock to the church if we are not blessed, if we are broken and poor and we are down and out? You see, what caught Naomi's attention was not that the famine was extended, but that the famine stopped and there was harvest. And when she heard that God had blessed his people, she turned back to the house of bread. I'm telling you, when people start hearing that God is moving in our churches, that God is moving in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's moving in our church buildings, that there's revival, the world is going to start flocking back to the church. But instead of condemning the world because they don't serve God like us, we need to get our act together and we need to start calling out to God so that we can come out of our spiritual famine, so to speak, and we can see the harvest come in so that we can receive fresh bread from heaven. Now Naomi makes a decision. She's going back. She's going back to Bethlehem. You see, Naomi came from a very wealthy and prosperous family in Bethlehem. So she knew Beyond Moab, there was something better. Beyond Moab, there was prosperity. Beyond Moab, there was a blessed place. She had tasted the blessings of God. She had seen the prosperity and experienced the prosperity of God. And she makes a decision that she's going to go to better. She leaves Moab. And she leaves with her two daughter-in-laws. And the Bible says they journey together. Opa. And Ruth, two Moabite women, two Gentiles, follow Naomi back to her homeland. But along the way, Naomi spoke to both of her daughter-in-laws and said to them, My daughters, go back to your families. Return to your families because I can't give you a husband. I can't give you what you need. You see, according to the law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 5, if if a person died in a family, a, a son in the family died, the widow had to remarry in the family. Why? That was to continue the family name, but not only that, so that the widow would not be plunged into poverty and she could be taken care of by whoever she married. But she had to marry back in the family. So when Naomi turns to Ruth and Opa, she's busy telling them, go, I'm releasing you. It was a selfless act. She was saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what I feel and what I think. What can I give to you? I can't give you husbands. Even if I'm married tonight and I'm, I fall pregnant, will you wait so long before you will marry my son? She says, no, my daughters, go back. At first, they don't. They refuse. But eventually, Opa, the one daughter-in-law, says to Naomi, Halfway on the way to Judah, to Bethlehem, the house of bread, she says to Naomi, I have to go back. You see, it was a risk to continue with Naomi. Because Naomi did not know if any of her family members were still alive in Bethlehem. And to go back meant that there was at least a guarantee that they could get married and they could have children. But to continue was a risk. To continue was a risk because they were Moabites and Israelites weren't, ex weren't very, uh, how can I say, they did not have a lot of acceptance towards Moabites. So to continue forward was a big risk, especially as a widow. And Ophra says, I can't take that risk. I've got to go back. And she leaves and she goes back to her family. And Naomi looks at Ruth, the daughter-in-law that was left behind. And she says to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law has returned to her family. And she says these words, and she has returned to her gods. In fact, I want to read it. Listen to this. Listen to this. I want to quickly get the scripture. Verse 15. Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. This is Naomi's advice to Ruth. She's saying to her, go, go back to Moab. This is a risk. I've got no guarantees for you. I don't know if we're going to be able to survive. 
I don't know if we're ever going to have to make a living. I'm old. My life, it's over. I've suffered enough. I've buried my sons. I've buried my husband. It just feels like nothing is working out. Go back. Go back. It was at that point that Ruth had to make a decision that we all have to make in moments of heartache and pain, in difficult times, in moments of tragedy, in a crisis. It's a decision we've all got to make. Are we going to turn back to where we've come from? Are we going to turn back to our Moab, so to speak, the place that God has delivered us from? Or are we going to move forward into the unknown? Are we going to move forward by faith? You see, in this difficult time, where petrol prices are going through the roof and where electricity hikes are coming and where the world is chaotic and it's just one crisis after another and there's no leadership. In this dark spiritual time, you and I have to make the decision that Ruth had to make. Are we going to go back to Moab? Are we going to go back to what is comfortable? Are we going to go back to what we know? Are we going to move forward and take a risk? In spite of our heartache, in spite of our pain, in spite of our suffering. You see, there's somebody listening. You've been suffering. You've been experiencing heartache. You've been experiencing pain. And you don't know if you can move forward anymore. You don't know if you can go forward anymore. But I've come tonight prophetically to tell you that God is speaking to you and saying to you, move forward. Leave mediocrity and move to better. Leave Moab and go to Bethlehem. I've got a Bethlehem waiting for you. I've got destiny waiting for you. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a calling for your life. Yes, you have suffered and yes, you've made mistakes. Yes, you don't have the picture perfect Life right now. But if you move forward with me, I will bless you. In fact, that's what Ruth did. She made a conscious decision that she was not going to go back to her gods. That she was not going to go back to her idol ways. In fact, listen to what she says. Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. It treat me not to leave you, speaking to Naomi. Or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people. And your God shall be my God. Wow. This Moabite woman. Who was cursed. Who came from a cursed bloodline. This Moabite woman. That had no future so to speak of. Who was willing to risk everything. To follow Naomi. Says these words. My, your God will be my God. I choose to serve your God. I choose to serve, serve the God of Israel. I choose to serve Jehovah. She made a decision in heartache. She made a decision in pain. With no guarantee that there would ever be provision. That there will ever be recovery. She made a decision. I'm moving forward. You see the thing is you've got to understand the context of Ruth's life. And who she was. She was a Moabite. Moabites were the result of sin, the Moabite nation. In fact, Moab was the son of Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. But Lot had been delivered out of Sodom by angels of the Lord. And he fled up into the mountains. And after his wife turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back and she defied the Lord's command not to look back when God rained judgment down on Sodom. She turned into a pillar of salt. Genesis chapter 19. And there in a cave up in the mountains. In a drunken state. Lot commits incest with two of his daughters. With both of his daughters. He only had two daughters. And they gave birth to two nations. Two tribes. Amnon and Moab. So Moab was born out of drunkenness and incest. Out of wickedness this nation was born. And this nation would become a demon worshipping nation. And Ruth was the great granddaughter of Lot. It's been suggested that she was the great granddaughter of Lot. So her background, looking back on her life, it's evil. It's wicked. In fact, there was a king in the Old Testament that threw one of his babies, a Moabite king, off a city wall in sacrifice to a demon god. In fact, they were so despised that the law of Moses, God said, 
in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 3, that no Moabite was ever allowed in the sanctuary of the Lord, where there was the gathering to worship Jehovah. No Moabite was allowed close by. And yet this Moabite, who's got this wicked and evil bloodline that she descends from, and she's got mediocrity as her history, makes a decision with hunger pangs, with a broken heart, with tears in her eyes, that I'm going to follow God, that I'm going to follow Jehovah, that I'm going to move forward with God. I've come to tell you tonight, with God in your future, your best days are always ahead of you. You see, the devil wants to lie to you and say to you that your best days are behind you. But I've come tonight to tell you, with God, your best days are before you. Yes, you've made mistakes. Yes, you have done things that you're not proud of. You've got regret. We all do to a certain degree. But you do have a choice to make. You can turn back to mediocrity or you can move on to better. And I also want to tell you tonight, just, just a side note. Naomi was going back to the land of promise. She was going back, crossing over the Jordan, back to Bethlehem, back to better. And who she was taking with her, out of the two daughter-in-laws, one only finished the journey with her. The other one turned back. Do you know how many children of God, precious children of God I've seen? Some of my members even, I've seen it. They will become so discouraged because they're trying to get somebody to Jesus. They're trying to get somebody to church. And then they don't come to church. And... They don't always want to attend church. And then it's as if, am I not doing a good enough, enough job to bring this brother, this sister to church? Why don't they want to come with me to church? I want to tell you, not everybody will go with you. Not everybody wants better. Not everybody wants to move on to the house of bread. Not everybody wants to serve God like you. Invite them anyway. Reach out to them anyway. Do what you can anyway. Do what you can and leave the rest up to God. But I want to tell you, when you move forward in life, not everybody's going to go with you. When you try to serve God, some people are actually going to turn back and say, you know what, I liked it in Moab better. I like it in the world better. There are people that will do that. But we've got to serve God anyway. We can't, as a result of somebody else moving backwards, decide that we're also going to move backwards. No, you've got to move forward. Because one day when you stand before the throne of God, you're going to give an account for your life and your life alone. You're going to be responsible for the decisions you made. The Bible says that Naomi and Ruth came into Bethlehem. And the Bible says something interesting. In fact, this blessed me. Listen to this. Verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. <laughs> you know what? Everything went wrong. The minute they decided to come back into the will of God and to follow God. The minute they both decided that they're going back to Bethlehem. God made sure that they came to the right place at the right time. And I want to take it one step further. And they met the right people. In fact, they encountered a divine connection. The very next verse, Ruth chapter 2 verse 1. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Wow! God connected the dots, brought them back into a place of harvest and prosperity and abundance. And there, later on in this story, Ruth encounters Boaz. Boaz encounters Ruth. Boaz is the kingsman redeemer of Naomi. What's a kingsman redeemer? A kingsman redeemer was somebody that took care of a widow in the family. If a widow had suffered loss and she could not provide for herself, the closest relative to her husband that she buried would have to take care of her. That's what was called the kingsman redeemer. In fact, this is a picture of Jesus Christ that becomes our kingsman redeemer. And Boaz was her kingsman redeemer. But Boaz would end up marrying Ruth. And Ruth would eventually have a child. 
And the child's name was Obed. And Obed would have a child. And his name was Jesse. And Jesse would have a child. And his name was David. In fact, he had eight children. But the eighth born, the youngest, was David. And he became King David. You see, when Ruth decided to follow God, he altered her destiny. He altered her destiny. God altered the destiny of Ruth. So much so that in the very first chapter of the New Testament, listen to this, in the very first chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, when we read about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, we find the name of Ruth. Right there in the very first chapter, in the bloodline of Jesus. Listen to this. Verse 5. Salmon was the father of Boaz. And Boaz was the father of Obed. And his mother was Ruth. This Moabite woman. That came from a bloodline of sin and wickedness. Who had no future to speak of. Who suffered tragedy and pain and heartache. Who lived under very difficult circumstances. And the odds were stacked against her. Become so blessed that she becomes a part of the bloodline of Jesus. She becomes the great grandmother of King David. And where did it start? She decided to follow Jehovah. The one decision you and I have to make in times of difficulty. In a time of crisis. Is are we going to follow God? Or are we going to turn back to mediocrity? Are we going to go back to Moab? What decision are you going to make? When you choose God, you choose Him better. You're rejecting mediocrity. When you choose God, you're going back to the house of bread. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what mistakes you've made. I don't know what regret you're living with. I don't know what's your history. I don't know what's your past. But one thing I do know, with God in your future, there are great days ahead. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what's happening around us, Choose to focus on God. Choose to turn to God. He will send a Boaz across your path. And a Boaz is not always a partner or husband. It can be a divine connection that will open one door for you and your life will change. That will open one door for you and your destiny will be altered. God knows who to send across your path at exactly the right time so that you can walk in the very blessing and prosperity of God. In fact, God said to his people... In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 15, he says, Choose between life and death. Choose between prosperity and destruction. Did you know prosperity is a biblical term? God wants to prosper you so that you can testify about the goodness of God. But it starts with making that one decision, that one decision, that one choice. What are you going to choose in a time of difficulty? You don't have to figure out everything else. You don't have to figure out how you're going to make it through this time. Just make that one decision. I choose to serve God. Let us pray. Father God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I want to thank you for the revelation that we have out of the book of Ruth. I want to thank you, Lord, in a time of famine, in a time of distress, that you, Lord, have called us to prosper. But I pray, Lord, show us where we've moved outside of the will of God. Show us, Lord, where we have done things which we think is right in our own eyes. That, Lord, has grieved your heart. Show us, Lord, where we have made a step in the wrong direction. Where we have come to Moab, so to speak. And help us to get back to Bethlehem. Help us to get back into the plan and the purpose of God. To come back to that place of destiny. So that we can walk in the fulfillment that you have for us. The purposes and plans of God. Lord, I pray right now for every Naomi that's watching. Lord, that has gone through tragedy and suffered pain as a result of what they've experienced over these last couple of years. Lord, deliver them out of their Moab. Help them to cross their Jordan. Help them to come to a place of destiny. I pray, Lord, for every roof that is trusting you for divine connection and open door. Lord, that you will give them a divine connection. That you will bless them with their Boaz, so to speak. I pray right now, Lord, that you will open up the right doors. That you will bless us. Lord, with blessings that can only come from you. Lord, establish us as your called, chosen, and anointed ones in this time. That people will look at us and see and testify about the goodness of God. I speak a blessing over every person that's watching right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, give them wisdom and discernment to go according to your plan and purpose for their lives. Guide us, Lord. Lead us, Lord. Be our shepherd so that we shall not want. We give you all the glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, this is your moment right now. Maybe you've grown lukewarm in your faith. Maybe you don't serve God like you used to. Why not give your heart to Jesus? Make right with God and come back into the will of God. Maybe you're stuck in Moab, so to speak. It's time to come back to Bethlehem. I want to lead you in a prayer. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your lips and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. That's the qualification for salvation. So let me lead you in a prayer right there where you are. Just say these words. Father God, I come to you tonight. Or I come to you this day. And I call upon the name of Jesus. And I confess with my lips that Jesus is Lord. I give my heart to you, Jesus. I surrender my life to you, God. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I need a savior. I confess Jesus as my Lord. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me from the inside out. Do a work in my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer, I believe you've received the free gift of salvation. Get into a good Bible-based church. Support that pastor. Be committed to that pastor. If you are in a church, be more dedicated and planted and rooted in that church. Keep God first place. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time listening to good anointed preaching to feed your faith. And if you keep God first, you will see the hand of God upon your life. You won't. It doesn't mean you won't experience problems. It doesn't mean that you are immune to problems. It just means that you will experience the goodness of God. And in spite of problems, in spite of the bad and difficult circumstances of life, it will be as if there's a supernatural grace upon your life because God is with you. I leave you with that thought tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. God bless every one of you for taking the time to watch. Thank you to all of you that share. If you've not dropped a comment down below, please drop a comment down below. I'd love to take the time to greet you. I'm going to quickly greet everybody that's online. I want to say welcome to Henry Bridger. It's good to have you online. Andre Loschbach, my brother, God bless you. Theo and Mariki Kriya, God bless you. Nazel Bates, welcome. Rene Stofbach, welcome. Leonie Loschbach, welcome. Anne Wilson, it's good to have you online. Trudy de Beer, God bless you, my sister. Diane Burning, it's good to have you online. Kleinus Mohammed, welcome. Janine Bosman, welcome. Kaylin Melanda, thank you very much for taking the time to watch. Joey Ulifir, God bless you. Lisa Kriya says, hi family. Hi Lisa, God bless you. Salome Falun, good evening. Bernard Brophy, it's good to have you online. Tasha DeToy, it's good to have you online. I'm so glad you're out of hospital, safe at home and back online. God is good. And I'm so glad that you are right. Jeanette Kriya says, eternal truth. Amen, amen. God bless you, Jeanette. Amen. Albertus van Avestes, and God bless you, my brother. Judy Okamp, it's good to have you online. Amen. Yaki Fashta, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Amen. Jody Kriya, my brother, good evening to you. God bless you. Evil Boma, God bless you. Yulani and Michael Boerter, it's good to have you online. Anna Steenkamp, welcome. Amen. Thank you to all of you that have spent... This last hour watching and listening, I appreciate it. You must have a blessed evening. This is Pastor Dominic. I'm signing out. I'll see you Wednesday night, same time, same place, here on Facebook, live at 8. God bless.